Hallelujah. And we're on. Praise God. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Praise the Lord. Glad you're with us and uh, happy to have you. And I'm going to get the sound off of my phone so that it's quiet. And I'm going to turn the little switch so that nobody calls me in the middle of church because that happens all the time. And um, but we're really glad to have you and, and uh, hope you're having a great week. And praise the Lord. And we can all say this. God is good. Amen. Amen. All the time. Praise God. A few announcements. Um, uh, we uh, obviously have church on Sundays, Wednesday nights. Um, we have a guest uh, missionary with us in the from the Middle East, North Africa region uh, on the Sunday, the 26th. Hallelujah. Um, that being said, we're also having our Raymond Ministerial Association International uh, Ministers District meeting on the 24th. And so anybody that would like to help us with that, um, uh, please let us know. We'd love to have you join with us and, and um, help us out serving. Um, uh, I'm not sure how many we're going to have right now. I'm, I'm getting feedback. It looks like it could be uh, much larger than last time. Um, but, you know, uh, we don't know. I'm planning on coming, and then, you know, oh, we can't make it, you know. So anyway, um, that that could be 20 to plus, so we just don't know right now. Hallelujah. Janie's going to make spaghetti. So, uh, But if you'd like to help serve, we'd let, you, let us know. We'd like to have you with us, uh, being a blessing to all these ministers. Amen? Hallelujah. And um, our missionaries will try to make, actually will try to make it into town uh, in time to make it for that, to be with us. Um you know, it's always good if, you, if you've ever lived, if you've ever been in a foreign country. I mean, you know, it's it's different than here. It's a different world, and um, going into some countries is even more. It's even very, it's very different. Um, I went into Estonia uh, eighteen months after the Iron Curtain fell, and what I saw then was just something. You know, you just you, you can't hardly fathom what it's like to be in a country where there, you just don't go to the store and get meat. You just don't go to the store. I mean, what they what they called um, the grocery store has meat. They would line it for four hours and go in. There'd be like this chicken wire bin with meat just chopped and thrown in the middle of it. And they were excited. We walk in looking if it's not packaged, if it's not bright red, if it's not whatever. <laughs> I ain't kidding. You got a little brown on the edge. Nope, I'm not buying that. <laughs> they were excited to get anything they get their hands on. So, um, but then, live, and then you go and live in a country that's a completely different culture, and uh, do the work of God for decades. Um, it's just good to get around people and be blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. So, anyway, all right, let's get let's get into here. We're going to get into the Word of God. We we were ministering last week on making decisions. You know, decisions, decisions, decisions. Amen. And I want to I want to uh, kind of segue or tie into whatever the right word would be for that uh connect to that <laughs> caboose to that how about that hallelujah not, not one of those electronic cabooses but you know the real thing hallelujah um tie into that with part of our decision making paradigm amen because there are certain things that we need to do in life that will facilitate making good decisions all right when we you know we can say well you know Let's go to the word. You know, some, you know, let's go to the word first. Da 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 da, da. Um, and that that is those are true principles. But let's let's add a paradigm to it that will be an, a great aid in making good decisions. Amen. So let's we want to talk about establishing priorities. Okay, because as a believer, we need to have we need to prioritize our life, and too many believers have their priorities out of balance. Uh, they're not in the right order, as, as it were. In other words, um, they, have, they have decided that uh, what's, what is important, what is most important, etc. And too often times, they're in the right, wrong order, and it's causing them to make bad decisions by it being in the wrong order. Okay? So, <coughs> Martha, let's look at Luke chapter 10, if you will. We'll start there with the opening text. 
Luke chapter 10. And we'll just pick up um, in verse 38. How about that? Okay, Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went, they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. <coughs> and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone and um, bid her therefore that she help me well you know she's she's in there working away she's in there doing her service and upset that her sister's out there just sitting there watching listening to the word okay and Jesus said Martha Martha thou art careful and troubled about many things but one thing is needful and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Um, this gives us insight into do two different people. Uh, both love the Lord, obviously, and want to serve and please him, yet in different ways. The problem with Martha is that she has misplaced priorities. Okay? Not that it was wrong to serve the Lord, but she was busy serving while he was ministering. You know, where she was, you know, trying to get the, all the food ready and all this kind of stuff, and what, da, 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 instead of hearing what he had to say. Okay? And um, when you have a misplaced priorities, you'll make decisions based on the wrong information. In Martha's case, she thought Jesus would be pleased with her serving when, in fact, Mary had chosen the good part. Okay? What we want to do is choose the good part for our lives. Then we'll make good decisions because that good part is based upon the word, uh, hallelujah, being first place in our lives. Amen. Okay. So the priorities of life are, listen to this, are lifetime commitments requiring a quality decision. Now, Brother Cope used to talk about quality decisions. He used to teach a series on quality decisions. And a quality of decisions is a decision that you make and don't turn back on. Okay? It's not, it's, it becomes basically an immutable, unchangeable decision in your life. I have made a quality decision to follow Jesus. I will not turn back from it. Amen? It's, it's for, it's if it was a forever decision. It will not change. Um, I remember a number, uh, not that many years ago, uh, the leader of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference got caught embezzling or something, and he got, de he got defrocked, rightfully so, and then he became a Muslim. Well, that tells me, number one, he wasn't even born again. Not, not that you can't lose your salvation. And he that quickly and that easy just went and switched over to be a Muslim. He, he was a political figure, okay? Even though you got the word Christian in there, it don't mean anything. You can have Christian on all kinds of stuff. Oh, by the way, you know that we're now christo fascist. That's the new term they're using for us Christians. It's Christo fascist. Yeah, that the school systems need to protect their children from the Christo fascist parents. I'm telling you. And they're in our school systems. Anyway, just thought you'd want that little tidbit of information. It has nothing to do with my sermon. All right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, I'm not a Christo fascist. You know what I mean? It's none of your business how I raise my children in the school system. All right, um, but my kids are already grown. We know that. So what is the number one priority of life? Now, we have all kinds of things we think of priority. We think our jobs are a priority. They are. We think our children are a priority. Our spouses are a priority. The church we attend should be a priority. Some people decide it's, it's, it's an option, you know. Uh, it becomes optional. Well, you know, uh, I go there, you know. I don't believe anything they say there. I just go there. Yeah. I, I like two or three people there, and we hang out together. So that's why we go. Okay. Um, and then somewhere in there, a lot of times we'll say, God, God's priority in my life. But where, what is the order of these things? Now, Dr. Stewart, <coughs> Ken Stewart, who was the international provost at Rainbow Bible Training Centers when I was there, international, of the different ones around the world, um, Dr. Stewart used to say this. He, he said, um, 
that when you set priorities in life, if, for example, you're not married, you leave that priority where it belongs and you don't fill it. Because if you don't, when, the, when you do get married, they're not going to slide into that slot because you've got everything else pushed up in there. Okay? you gotta keep it. You got to keep it blank. You know? Okay, this, this slot in my life is when I do get married. And I do have children, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't, you know, you know don't whatever. So um, we, ha we have to be careful about priorities, all right? The number one priority in life is your personal, intimate, forever, quality decision to follow God through the Lord Jesus Christ. God is your number one priority. He comes before your children. He comes before your spouse. He comes before your job. And he comes before your church. And a church plays a role in your life, but it doesn't come before God. Hello. Now, we got people right now in churches that have gone, uh, you know, AWOL from the kingdom of God. They've, they've, they've put in homosexual ministers or lesbian ministers. And I, I say that as an oxymoron because they're not ministers of, of God. They are ministers of darkness. Okay. And, I, you know, it's hate speech. It's not hate speech. It's just truth. They're emissaries of the devil. Called and anointed by Satan himself to deceive people. All right? We say, that's harsh. No, that's truth. Let me tell you something, folks. If Paul wrote a letter and to throw out and to bind over Satan, the guy living with his stepmama, what do you think he would write to the church today? Oh, my. Okay? Um, God has to be your number one priority. Now, that means that when your church doctrine comes crosswise to God and his word, your church, you either leave it or change, they have to change it. Well, I, my, uh, my mama was a such and such, and my daddy was a such and such, and my grandparents were such and such. We even got name placards on the back of the pew and one of the stained glass windows. Well, I tell you what, go get a screwdriver and take the name placard off and uh, order a replacement pane for the stained glass window and take them with you and go somewhere else if, they, if they're not teaching truth anymore, if they violate the Word of God. All right? Now, Exodus 20, and we're not going to read all 132, but one of, the, one of the verses in there says this, God spake these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, there are people, and, and, here, and you've got to understand how I say this. You know, there is nothing wrong with golf. We've got an avid golfer here. Man loves to play golf. Don't know when the last time you played. Been a while. But Jerry likes to play golf. And I'll ride by on Sunday mornings, and the golf course is full of people playing golf. What were they doing Saturday? What are they doing Sunday afternoon? You know? Well, I got to get out there and relax. So, see, you put the golf before God, then golf becomes your God. Now, I'm not saying that once in every whatever you go and do something uh, recreational on Sunday instead of being in church. <laughs> You're not bound to every Sunday for the rest of your, every single service forever. That's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, we have golf every, uh, I can't go to church. I have tea time every Sunday at 9 o'clock. And we ain't talking about one lumps two. Okay? With, with, with uh, biscuits. Hot tea and biscuits. Which is cookies. <laughs> Got to have your tea and biscuits. <laughs> Hallelujah. And the Brits love their tea and they love their cookies. And their cookies are good. And their tea. The English breakfast tea I got in England was good. They even put it over ice for me. You know, that's sacrilegious to a, to a Brit, but they, they like the Yanks, so they, they put it over ice for me. Hallelujah. And I sweetened it up before they did. You know, put a lot of sugar in it, got it sweetened in. Yeah, all right. Anything that you place at a higher priority than God becomes a God. Okay? You can't place anything beyond God. It's place in your life above God. He has to be number one. Why? 
he is your God. He is your Lord. He is your God. He is your he is everything in your life. And by having him, number one, other things can fall into place and you'll be more successful at all your other priorities of life by having him. Number one. Amen. Now, there's people who disagree with that, don't like that. That's because God's not their number one priority. Now, people tell me all the time, uh, you don't look 64. And um, I'm, th I'm thinking, about, I, th I, don't, I think I look 64. Anyway, they don't think I look 64. I get people at work going, you know, one guy, you know, he, he looked older than me. And he was saying something about that I had all my hair and he doesn't have all his. He said, but, you know, um, I'm, I'm older than him. I said, how old are you? He said, 54. I said, I'm 64. Okay. And but see, people, they say, man, you know, you know, we talk about genes, genetics, or whatever. And I think, no, it's the life of God. I got relatives that look 10 years older than me either, and they're 10 years younger. Why? Well, God in my life, His life in me, His nature in me, it renews me. Amen. Keeps me younger. Glory to God. Didn't say I won't get old, but it just keeps me younger while I'm getting there. Hallelujah. Psalm 119, 164 says, Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Uh, Psalm 27, 8. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, I will seek. Hallelujah. Psalm 63, 1 through 3. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy gl glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Amen. So Matthew 22, 36 through 38. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Amen. In John 21, 15 through 17, says, So when they dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonas, lovest thou me more than the, me more than these? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Um, he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith again to him, What did I do? <laughs> I turned it off and the sound came out anyway. Um, love, Simon, love, son of Jodas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. And Jesus said, Feed my lambs or my sheep. Now, what's he talking about here? If you love God, you're going to obey God. Okay? Too often in the church, what we have done is we've turned Jesus and the gospel message as in the fire escape from hell. We commit enough not to go to hell. But we're not putting him first in our life. And that's because we love him the most. Okay? We have to love God more than anything else. More than sleep. More than TV. More than vacations. More than recreation. You know, recreation is, is recreation. All right? We, we, well, how do we really recreate? We get with God. The best way for recreation. Now, listen, don't, don't, do not go off the deep end with this. I am not talking about, Pastor Ed said we can't go on vacation. He said we can't go have any fun. We can't go to a theme park. We can't do anything. Just get in the closet and pray 24 7. If you're a real Christian, that's all you do. Is there something else I can help with? <laughs> Shut up. She went away. <laughs> did I say Siri? Did you hear me say Siri? 
No. I didn't say Siri. But Siri thought I said Siri. And he messed up my sermon. So where was I when, when Siri interrupted me so rudely? Yeah. Right. That's not, that's not putting God first is never to do anything. You are natural. You have natural needs. You need to eat. Well, I'm not going to eat because I've got to serve God. Well, you, you, you will be with him very, very soon. Okay? You keep that up. That is not the point that's being made. It is in your, the priorities of life, he is elevated to number one. Now, if he's number one priority, that means that there are other priorities. Okay? We don't let them supersede him, but he also knows in his word, and he has things in his word about those priorities, and we have to place them in the right place. He reckoned, he made you that. He made us triune. He made us spirit, soul, and body. As he's made God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, he made us a three-part being. Okay? And each of those parts have needs. God recognizes that. All right? So it's not wrong to have the other priorities. It's just as long as they're in the right place. But So number one, God has to be the number one. He's got to be number one. Amen. You talk, you, you worship God too much. You know, it's not good for our marriage. Now, wait a second now. Okay. Now, when your spouse starts telling you, you know, you, you know, the, uh, God's too important in your life and they, they want to be your number one. No, you can never be my number one. Okay. You can be and should be my number two. Okay. Because as a believer, our number one priority in life is God, but our second priority is our spouse. That meaning if you're a woman, it's the man, and if you're a man, it's a woman. <laughs> Biological, born that way. Okay? Not because they got demons that tell them there's something they're not. All right? You're being hateful. No, I'm being truthful. We do not have to follow your gender dysphobia demon that's running around on top of your shoulders. Okay? Biblically speaking, marriage is between a man and a woman. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Okay? Be fruitful and multiply was the commandment. Two men, whether one's had gender reassignment surgery or not, cannot produce. It's impossible. Hello? Science has to fake it. But it can't be real. They cannot reproduce. Lord, help us. And back in COVID, everybody wanted to follow the science. Now it's, that's not science. That's a mess. There's some messed up people out there. <laughs> Genesis 2, 18. God and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed the beast of every field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever ever Adam called every, every living creature, what, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave, name, gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help meat for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. Now, you know where they got that from, don't you? He woke up and went, whoa, man. <laughs> okay. It's a little pastor humor there. Y'all just not with Come on, guys. I always thought that was pretty funny. And I hadn't said it in years, so it should be like new to you. All right. Um, made a woman and brought her into a man. And then Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, but they were not ashamed. Why? They were covered in the glory of God. We don't have time to go into all that tonight. Okay? And so woman came out of man. Now, please don't send me no stupid, misogynic uh, comments and, you know, you're a male chauvinist pig and all this stupid stuff. This is the way it happened. Okay? You need to get that devil cast out of you. I ain't got any. Yeah, you do. Got an ugly devil. 
nasty devil. And it's the truth. And you said, Amen. God, God has an elevated place for women, but it is not in place of the man. We're not the same. We are incomplete without each other. If we are the same, then we'll always be incomplete. If we're all men, we'd be incomplete. If we're, all, if we're all women, they'd be incomplete. The man and the woman are a completion of each other, not designed to be the same, to do the same, to function the same. God created it a different way. And that one complements the other in a, 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 a mystical union of completion. It was created by God to be that way. Okay? Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, Matthew 19.3, Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, saying, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? You know, she burnt my supper. I'm divorcing her. You know, uh, she got old. I'm divorcing her. Well, look at your, your, your ugly self. Hello? I mean, you, you, you weren't even good looking when you were young. Now you got older. You worse. You're going to get rid of your wife because she got old and got a little heavier, you know? And she probably don't think you're all that sexy riding around with your gray chest hair showing with that big jewelry, gold jewelry hanging out and your buttons, buttons undone to here. You ain't hot. Now, you might be, as the kids call it, a hot mess. Okay, that's a new term. You're just a hot mess, but you ain't hot, all right, for every cause. In other words, you know, anything, any reason you come up with, you want to get rid of your wife, you could. That's what they wanted him to say. And um, he answered and said, you have not read that that which from the beginning he made them male and female. Like, like one guy used to say, in the beginning he made him Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Okay, and he said, you're harm hammering on that. We live in a society that is altogether perverse in regards to humanity and, their, uh, and who they are for a man or woman. Dear Lord, we used to be able to teach biology class to say this is what makes you a man, that's what makes you a woman. Now you can't do that. It's how you feel. I feel like I'm the boss of the whole Guilford County school system. They got to pay me like that and give me that job because I feel like that. No, it doesn't work that way. Nothing works that way. You're wherever you work and whatever job you have, you just can't go, well, I feel like the boss today. See what happens. Walk into your boss's office and say, get out of my chair. That's mine. Why? I feel like I'm the boss today. You know? You have employment dysphobia. And the consequence for it will be unemployment dysphobia. Because they'll throw you out. You're not, I don't care what you feel like, you ain't the boss. All right? He said that he created them. It was not so from the beginning. He created them male and female. And they said, for this cause, what? The fact that he created a male and female. Shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife? They shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they shall be no more twain, that's two, but one flesh. What God therefore have joined together, let no man put asunder. Okay? And they said unto him, why did Moses then give command to, uh, uh, to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? He saith, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart suffered you to put away your wife but from the beginning it was not so and i say unto you whosoever shall put away his wife except to be for fornication and shall marry another committeth adultery whosoever marrieth her that's put away shall commit adultery okay now the very hard hard cast law there and we you know we've used that to really ram people um people have divorced people and you can just get back guarantee if they divorce somebody, they've gone out and gone and seen somebody else. All right? They got somebody on the slide. May not be able to prove it, may not have evidence, picture evidence, you don't want it anyway. But you may not have evidence to, that, you know, uh, they're out there doing stuff. Okay? All right? So we can't, so we, we try to make this such a hard thing that if you've ever been divorced or remarried, you, know, you're, you're, you can't even join the church in some cases. Then you got one, one church that'll give you a, um, they will, um, nullify 
your marriage instead of giving you a divorce because you can't get a divorce. So they will they'll nullify it, but they won't let you get a divorce. Okay? God's plan was for us to get married and stay married. That's God's plan. That was God's plan forever. Now, when we say stuff like this, we don't want people who've been divorced or married, you know, um, and of course, he said for the cause of divorce, I mean fornication. Sex with somebody else outside your marriage, adultery, fornication, whatever it is. I mean, those, both of fornication and um, adultery will, if you, if you commit fornication with somebody else, you've committed adultery against your spouse. Period, bottom line, end of story. Okay? In divorce, you're, they're free to marry. Okay? You're the scoundrel. Okay, all right. I mean, um, I heard one story. Minister, he was he was uh, he was a, a pastor of a church, and him and the I don't know what it is about women on the piano. <laughs> I just don't know. But you know, the church organist, the church pianist, and the, and and him, got, we're getting a little Marvin Gaye time in. And uh, of course, their spouses found out they ended up divorced, and rightfully so, they committed adultery. But another church had already set up to bring them up there because they had to resign the church because the church folks said, no, you can't do that. We ain't, we ain't staying. Going to bring them in, marry them, and then restore them back to ministry. Well, number one, <clears throat> they needed to be publicly repenting for what they were doing in the first place. Okay? You left, you left the other ones in, in shambles, and now you can go and be successful while the, while the spouses that you you destroyed your marriage with are sitting out there struggling with life because of what you did to them, okay, they're left with all kinds of stuff, all kinds of baggage. And see, if we put God first, now number one, if we put God first, we're going to hear Him say, "Don't you do it?" Hello, He'll probably tell you this: Don't you even think about it. And we have scripture that tells us when we start thinking on stuff, every sin comes because we took thought of it, it bore seed and came forth, and we did, acted on it. People don't get up in the morning and go, wow, I'm going to commit adultery today. It don't work that way. No, you've been, you've been walking on the slippery ditch bank. You've been flirting. Come on now. You have been. And you know it out there, if, you, if you've been ever involved, you know you were out there on that slippery ditch bank, and you were flirting and just, you know, you enjoyed it, you enjoyed the chaser, you enjoyed the chase, being the chasee, the chaser and the chasee, one of the two, and then you began to think about it, and began to say things, and began to build, and boom, Okay? Well, if God's taking first place in your life, you ain't going to be thinking about being with somebody else besides your spouse. You ain't going to be sitting around there dwelling on that. You ain't going to be sitting there figuring out, how can I? And get away with it. You can't. You can't get away with it. Well, my wife, has, I've been going to this for three years, and she never, it don't matter if she knew or not, he does. He's aware. That, that glass house you're living in is going to crumble. Amen? The windows are going to get knocked out. And you better hope she don't have a knife when they do. Like my wife told me, she said, you ever cheat on me, I'll kill you. I still sleep with one eye. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> don't have to because I never cheated on her. <laughs> Ain't going to. I like living. I'm just telling you. Okay? So God's number one. Your spouse is number two. And let me say this. If you really love your spouse the right way, she, you, you wouldn't do anything to her. Okay? Well, I just got caught up in, oh, excuse me, it wasn't a moment. That moment was pre-planned and predetermined way before it became a moment. Okay? There's just laws of seed time and harvest. That's the way things work. You're at work. You're flirting. Hello. 
You start caring about how you look at work, women and men. Go wear, you know, you come home and you look like uh, you just came out from slopping the hogs. You go to work and you're going to be put on the cover of GQ magazine. Hello? Women come home from work. They, I mean, they look like, uh, you know, they ain't had no paint on their face. They're wearing that ragged old uh, oversized shirt. They go to work. They, I mean, they dress, I mean, skin tight uh, skirts and, you know, uh, got, got the V-neck shirt on and all this stuff. And, you know, and learn how to do the twist. I'm talking about when they walk in. Hello? And you're playing that game. Well, there's no harm in it. I just, you know, I enjoy how it makes me. Yeah, you enjoy how it makes you feel. But if you really loved your spouse, number one, you would take uh, the time to be better presentable to them instead of just becoming an old married couple. Hello? You would care. So you've got to give them a priority in your life as your spouse. You got to love them, husbands and wives. Men, you just can't be some slob. You know, you want your wife to you know look all sweet and pretty and all that kind of stuff, and you come in with 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 your t-shirt up to here and your belly hanging out, and you <sighs> are you here? And you got on you know got, uh, shorts that are slick from they weren't slick when you bought them. They broke all the fibers off. They're barely hanging on. Hello. Get up out of bed. Your hair looks like you know you you, you went through a tornado. Yeah, hey baby, you want you want to flirt? She look she look look at you thinking you never showed up to my house looking like that when we were dating. Hello. No. If you if you're gonna put, have them as a priority and a priority, they're not your roommate. Hello. They're not your side piece. They're your spouse. Therefore, they have a prioritized place in your life, and it is the number two spot in your priority list. Not your grandchildren, your children, the dog, anything else. They're the number two priority in your life. God is your number one. Your spouse is your number two. Well, you just don't understand. No, 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 no. There is no understanding. They are your number two priority. Because if you don't have that right, forget keeping the children intact. Hello? So God's first, spouse is second. God intended for your marriage to be a God-based marriage. Now, Dick and Ellie have been married longer than anybody in here, I think. How long y'all been married? 50? Forty-nine. So you're three years behind them. Okay, Janie and I hit forty-two this year. Anybody else longer than those three? Okay, so we got we got three forty-plus years marriage in here right now. It ain't because we just are special. <laughs> it's because God's first, and then they were second, and we kept those priorities in order. We kept them in the right place. We based it on a Christian principle. Amen? When failure tried to present itself in our lives, we didn't accept the failure. Wow. See, if God's number one in your life, when the challenges come up in marriage, then we go back to God and follow Him, which will lead us to do the right thing in our marriage. Amen? Amen? And I can tell you, someone else getting involved ain't that. That's not what he plans. That's not part of his plan. I mean, like, like that bozo said one time in our church. I mean, I had, I had to correct it after the left. I said, okay, I can't let that sit out there. That Bathsheba was God's will for David. How do you know? Solomon. Ooh. So David had made, I mean, uh, Bathsheba had a lifetime commitment with Mordecai, not Mordecai. What was that name, Mordecai? What was his name? I forgot his name. Her husband. Uriah, Uriah thank you, thank you. We just covered it. Uriah, 
Uriah, Mordecai was somebody else. It was, here's another story. Okay. Uriah, God's not going to take a committed husband. Then this man's so committed to different things, he won't violate his honor. So we know he's a good man. Okay? God's, God's not going to break that marriage up by murder. Now you make a go of God, a co conspirator in conspiracy to commit murder, murder, a cover up. Because Bathsheba was God's plan for David all along. That's the biggest pot of goobity gawk I've ever heard. Come out, supposed to be Christian teaching. I'm sorry. So whenever they said that, I got next service and said, I'm sorry. I knew I had to correct it because the whole church was waiting for something to be said. And the only reason I didn't do it in person was because I didn't want to absolutely annihilate the guy in front of everybody. You know, I, heard, I got that from Brother Hagin. We just sent them on down the road, blessed them, and they never came back. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> um, when you have God as your number one and your spouse as your number two, okay, so your marriage relationship will now be governed by God. You'll make decisions about your marriage about how you act and treat and do towards your spouse based on what the Word says because you want to honor God and you want to honor God in your marriage. Okay? Now, after the spouse comes the children. They do not come before your spouse because if you do, they're out of order and you'll make bad decisions. You'll make decisions in regards to the priority of your spouse that will be wrong because you've elevated your children above your spouse. Okay? Can't do it. They can't come, become a higher priority than your spouse. Okay? Well, the kids have got to be here, and the kids have got to be there, and the kids have got to do this, and the kids have got to do that, and they gotta they're involved in this, and they're involved in that, and all of a sudden you don't have any time for your spouse. Then there's too much going on with the kids. You place too much priority on the kids being happy, the kids doing everything on the planet that can be done. And listen, we, we, were, we, had to, we had to not fall into that same trap. Okay? And we refused to fall into it because we knew the dangers of it. It's easy to do. There's so much pressure out there for your kids to play this ball and for your kids to do that and your kids to do this. And, your, and you got to give them, you can't not deny them anything they want. Okay? You just, there's no denying what they want because they are your blessing. And uh, they'll throw a temper tantrum in the middle of your living room if they don't get to do such and such. And there's going to be times you're going to take them and say, no, I don't care how many parents and how many Karens show up and tell me that they have to be able to do this or you're not raising your child right. You're denying them an opportunity. My investment into my children uh, comes subordinate to my investment in my marriage because without a good marriage, I can't be a good father. I don't agree with that. You can be, no. You cannot be a good father or a good mother when your marriage is falling apart with your kids because you're doing damage to them that you don't understand. And that's why kids at 12, 11 years old, 8 years old, and 9 years old, and whatever, end up in therapy now. Well, I don't understand why they're... You don't understand why they're doing such and such? You uprooted the whole world? Because of your selfishness? We just couldn't get along. That's because you didn't have God first. Now, I know that there are people who wanted to keep their marriages together, worked hard to keep their marriages together, and the other spouse walked out and there's no, had no control over it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about they just all of a sudden wake up one day and they have no marriage because their kids are running their life. They never in church. They don't have any time for God. They don't have any time for each other. They, you know, the kids are running everything. You know, got an Excel spreadsheet of where one has, to, where everybody has to be at what time and what time they got to be picked up. Hello. And I, I just, listen, I get there are going to be times in life things are busy. But when this becomes the pattern of your entire life, 
year after year after year after year thinking, well, you know, when, we, when they get 18 and they go off to college, we'll have time for each other. Honey, you better be making time for each other all those 18 years. Hello? And I'm going to just give you a law of nature. If you're not making time for each other, the devil will make time for somebody else. Bam! It's the truth. You've got to. You've got to maintain these priorities and keep them right. God has to be number one. That is a, that is a, that's a non-disputable. Your spouse has to be number two. That is a non-disputable. Then you put your children in. Because when I get to the next one, you'll understand why I say that. Then your children come in. Okay? And you have, to, you have to do the right things. Now, Paul writes and says this. Um, let me say this. As parents, we have the responsibility to bring our ch children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. This relationship is the third most important human relationship we have. Psalm 127, 3. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, stop. Did not say children run the house. Hello? Now, they're watching Disney. Now, listen. Now, Disney used to do a lot of good things, okay? But a lot of stuff they're putting out now, a lot of their little sitcoms and stuff are full of worldly attitudes, kids mouthing off at their parents, kids demanding something, and their parents acquiescing, and the evil parents didn't follow through, okay? The Disney and, and, and all kinds of, um, I am sharing the forged youth instead of my page. I don't know how that happened. Oh, well, wherever Jesse is, she can come fix it. <laughs> this is a good one for Ford's youth to watch. All right. Really? Yep, it says share to Ford's youth. Feed. Yeah. Well, hallelujah. Some youth out there are going to get some good stuff today. <laughs> okay. Colossians 3.20, children obey your parents in all things, so this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Your kids are getting cell phones at 7. Well, you're not yours, kid, but kids are getting cell phones at 7, 11, 7, 11, at the 7-Eleven, probably. <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting tablets. They're getting free reign of television. They're hanging out with worldly, ungodly friends who have attitudes that, that smell up the whole planet. Amen? You're the parent. They are not. We walk into our school system today, and the kids are running it, not the, not the staff. Why? Because at home, they are the, they're in charge and not the parents. They just bring that right into the school systems. Hello? There's no discipline. There's no authority. There's no uh, submission. They do whatever they want to. I just had a, I watched a girl uh, cuss a, te a female teacher out the other day. I'm mean, using language, you know, you're thinking, sailors don't talk like that. Okay? Um, you have to be in charge. And part of that is training them and not allowing them to dictate to you what they are and what they are not going to do. And then you got these Karens of the world. I like that term because that's what they are. Karens. You know, that will put pressure on you to follow their lead. What? Well, well, let me tell me, tell me something about your life. Where does God fit? Oh, I love, what, yeah. Tell me how much. How about your husband? Amen. Do you ever tell your kids no? Oh, my, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I think I'll not listen to you. Yeah. Well, I want to play four sports at one time because all my friends are doing it. We're not doing it. There's not enough time in the day. There's not enough time to have our priorities of life in order. And you're just going to have to learn to live without it. Well, I want to play club ball year round. Because that's the only way I'm ever going to make it to the pros. You're probably not going to make it anyway. And if you're good enough to make it, you'll make it without having to have, you know, year round ball. 
parents are spending thousands of dollars a year to be on club teams. All the while being told by the coach, they're going to get better. They're going to get more playing time next year or next season. No, they need X number of people on the team to support their life. So, I mean, people, people are paying $1,000 a season for sports to play on club teams. Up to $1,000 or some places more. Well, you get 11 to 12, 14 players on a team at 1000 pop. And you're doing that four times, five times a year with some type of club team. You make a pretty good living doing nothing but walking out with a bunch of kids and coaching. And all the while, your kids are the ones starting all the time, by the way. And parents are rushing out there to get their kids to go out here and play scramble ball. That's what a lot of soccer is. You know, okay. And there's nothing wrong playing soccer. There's nothing wrong playing basketball. There's nothing wrong playing baseball. There's nothing wrong playing football, lacrosse, uh, ice hockey. Love, I love to watch ice hockey. You know, went to a fight and a ice hockey game broke out. <laughs> it does happen all the time. Okay? Nothing wrong with that. But when that, that becomes more important than anything I shall do in life, that all y'all do year round, and there's no time, there's no rest time, there's no break time, there's no time for y'all to stop and it be about you and your husband being good parents with your kids, doing th family things together, being an example before them, letting them see mom and dad love each other and they're important to each other and their life is that way and the kids get to, who's going to model marriage to your kids if you don't? Hello? How, do you, how are you going to teach them to be a good father or a good mother if you don't? Amen? And being a good father and being a good mother does not mean you give them everything they want just because they had the whim for it. Okay? Genesis 18, 19. For I know him, referring to Abraham, that he will command his children, his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord <coughs> to do justice and judgment. And the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which is spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous. Now this is God, you know, getting ready to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. But he said Abraham would command his children after him. So they become, they come after your spouse. They, now they, we're at God, we're at marriage, husband, wife. Now we're to children. Those are three priorities of life. You can't get them out of order. Okay? Um, let's move along because I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap this. It's, it's not a real, real long, long one. And there's a lot, I got a lot of scripts about raising children, but we're not going to get that deep into that tonight. The number four, you may think it's wrong, but listen to me here. The number four priority of life is your church. Where does my job fall? Later. You need a good church because you need the community support. Your relationship with God and your relationship with your spouse and your relationship with your children is enhanced by the relationship of a good church. Iron sharpens iron. There's wisdom. Amen? There's support. When you're struggling, there's support. When you're not really sure what to do, there's older women who can say, listen, here's how you balance this in your life. We've been down that road. We know what you got to do. Amen. Um, my husband and I are diff having a difficult time. There's wisdom on how to hand, how to how to deal with that and get that back in the right on the right track. Amen. Being in the services and hearing the word of God, anointed word of God, will help restore and re renew your mind to make sure you're keeping God first. So your relationship with your church is vital. But it doesn't come before your children. You can't take your kids, and they can never, ever, their whole entire life, no matter what, miss a church service because of some event. Because we go to church. Well, see, that's that's what that's good now. You're you're put, you're, you're going to cause hurt there, because if your kid like, 
Okay. They do play baseball. They play in school ball. Their team makes the state playoffs and the state championships on a Sunday. You can't play. Well, wait a second now. Church is important. You have them there unless you're on vacation or something out of town. You know, 50, 50 weeks out of the 52 a year. And they got one event that's going to be a once. It's not an every week. It's not a club ball where you play every Sunday. Now, I don't buy into that, you know, club. Well, we have a, we have a chapel. Who teaches it? You're going, to, you're going to take your kids out of church and let some parent who was at the bar on Saturday night do a chapel service on Sunday morning for the club team. Okay, no. But, you know, here you are, you're in the state playoffs, and it's the championship games on Sunday, and you're not going to let them play because we don't miss church. That was, you just, you just did damage to your kid and did something to them about God. Okay, the church is important, but it's a fourth priority. That's an important event in their life. They're not going to get that opportunity. If they're a senior in high school, they'll never get that opportunity again. Okay, if they're, if they're not a senior, they may not ever get the opportunity again because repeating is not that easy in sports. Okay, they have maybe a recital, and this is the, the biggest recital of their life, and it happens to be on a Sunday. So you're not, you can't go. No, 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 no. See, church is a valuable service to your family, to your growth, to your relationship with God, to your relationship with your spouse, to your relationship with your children. But you don't put it so that it, it governs everything so they can't do anything in life because of church. That, that is, that's the wrong placement of that emphasis. Okay? Now, when they come to you say, I want to play club ball, but we play every Sunday. No, I, I get that one because it's every Sunday. It's not like a, major, a, a sporadic once in, the, once in a great blue moon event. It's every Sunday. You know, we play on, we start on Friday nights and we play all day Saturday and we play Sundays until somebody wins. That's how that stuff works. They, put, they do these like round robin tournaments all the time, all weekend long. And that's how they're going to get their college scholarship. Now let's go back. What happens with your relationship with God? You have faith in God. If my kids need college money, we're going to believe God. I'm not going to spend $200,000 trying to get a scholarship for a sport to get a scholarship so they don't have to pay for college. I've already paid for it. Hello? And lost a lot of time in the process. Okay. So here, here at both sides of this, this is why we're talking about priorities. We place them in the right place. We don't overemphasize one to the point that it becomes a higher priority. So we don't overemphasize church to the place it becomes so much more of a priority than your children that your children aren't allowed to have life because they cannot miss church ever. We don't miss church ever. There's going to be times you need to. Are you here? There's going to be times that it's needful. So, well, because you also need to teach your kids that God cares about what they do in life and they cares about the things that, you know, that, that are important to them. And he will understand if you missed a service to play in the once in a lifetime state championship, he understands that or to play in a recital that you'll never get a chance to do. Maybe uh, your kids are playing instruments and they're first or second chair in the, you know, the orchestra and they're going to get to play at the Tanger Center, you know. A, you know, it, it's just, it's like one of these major opportunities that they may not ever get again, but it's Sunday morning. And you hate to tell the pastor because, you know, he's going to say, you need to be in church. If you come to me and say, that's what's going on, I'm going to say, you go, have fun. Take pictures, I want to see them. Are you here? Because we want them to understand that your family has priorities and that they're their involvement in things, now they're not superseding everything else, but when properly placed, this is an important thing, this is an important event, they've earned the right to do this, and why are you going to deny them by elevating church above their position? We don't, okay? We realize that church is a valuable and high priority, it just, you know, I've, I've met women, they're ministers, their husbands are unsaved. And they're always running around ministering somewhere, going to church somewhere, and leaving their husbands at home all the time. They put church above their husbands. Mm -hmm. 
Hello? Well, he don't mind. No. He don't want to deal with all your harassing. He'd rather you get out of the house and leave him alone. Because he's not prioritizing the right place. You've taken church things and put it above him. Amen. I mean, maybe your unsaved spouse would like to take the weekend and go to the mountains during leaf changing time because they love you in spite of your stupidity. Hello? I can't miss church. I'm not going to put that before God. Come on now. Let's find the balance here. Church has its place. It has a priority. But they need to know you love them. And you can show them the love of God and, and so forth. And you, you don't have to have this rule that I can't miss church to be with you and go to the mountains. Well, do you want them to go to heaven or not? You better do some stuff that shows them you love them and so let them see God in you and that God cares about them too. Amen. All right. Now, Matthew 16, 18 says, I say to you, thou Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Gates of hell shall not prevail. So the church is important. Now, this is not talking about the, him being the pope. Okay? We, we, don't, we don't need to get on all the Greek on that one tonight. Um, Acts 7, 38, this is, uh, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel and spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Acts eleven twenty two. these tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. They sent forth Barnabas that he should go far as far as Antioch. Uh, Acts 1, 11, 26, and when he found them, he brought them into Antioch. It came to pass when the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And I got into about another 20 verses. I'm not going to read them. The, you know, the church is our fourth priority of life. Okay? Let me get, let me get number five. We're going to close here. I'm, I'm highlighting this. I'm not running real deep on them. I just want to give you something to think about, okay? Number five is your job, your employment. You will be a better employee if you are satisfied with your walk. You are in walking in a, the right place with God. You're walking in the right place with your marriage. You're walking in the right place with your kids. You're walking in the right place with your church. You will be a better employee, a more effective employee, and a, a longer-lasting employee. You do need to work. The hand of the sluggard. You know, there's a lot the Bible has to say about it. Um, okay? You know, it's Ephesians 6, 5. Servants, be obedient to those who are your ma masters. Give respect to them and eager concern to please them in singleness of motive and with your heart as service to Christ. Okay? And we're not going to read all these scriptures. You, you, your job has to be important. It's got to be an important part of your life. Okay? You don't go... I can't ever work because I got to spend time with my wife. If you start missing uh, work because your kids have 65 ball games this week, you're not going to have a job. Okay? Now, you can't take your job and never be there for your kids. My daddy's never been at anything I've ever done while he was working. Okay? then you got a priority misplaced because you've got to be there for your kids. Your wife never sees you because you're working. Who do you think is going to pay the bills? Come on, man. You, you're supposed to be the leader of faith. You're supposed to be trusting God. You're supposed to be believing God. Amen? You're going to be the spiritual leader in the house. And you're going to go out and work, you know, work and work and work and work and work uh, so that your wife can run up down the road with the kids. Everything's out of whack. You can't ever do anything. You can't, be, you can't ever see your wife. can't ever be with your kids. can't ever be in church. can't ever do anything because you're working. See, work's out of priority. Okay? You get it to a priority. Listen, let me say this. Success cannot be the controller of your priorities. Well, we want this size house with this much money and this kind of car and yada, 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 yada. And this is, we got the sacrifice we have to make. If you're sacrificing your marriage, number three, if you're sacrificing your walk with God, if you're sacrificing your marriage, if you're sacrificing your kids and you're sacrificing your church for the success that you think the world, that you should have, then you are messed up and your priorities are out of order. And then we tell you something, it's a house of cards and it's all going to crumble. 
You're going to wake up one day and your kids aren't going to know you. Your wife is going to be gone. You won't even know who God is. And you don't even know, you ain't been in church for so long, you don't even know what one looks like. Hello? Okay. You might have to modify your lifestyle. And don't let church prosperity teaching uh, become the leverage that gets you to follow the world's pattern for success. Well, I want to have, you know, uh, a Lamborghini, and I want to have a house on the Riviera, and God don't mind if I prosper. No, he doesn't. He doesn't mind if you prosper. But he binds if it costs you your walk with him, with your spouse, with your children, and with your church because it's out of priority. Okay? You don't have to have what the world says is success to be successful. Amen? Jesus told us, don't store your treasures up here on the earth, but store them up into heaven. He says, because here on the earth, moth doth enter in and rust and corrupts. Store your treasures in heaven. Okay, so you didn't have a 14,000 square foot house with butlers and maids and a, um, you know, a car wash that washed your car as you drove in from the afternoon because it was a little dirt on your car. And you got the beach house and you can't ever be in church because you're at the beach house on the weekends. And you got all these things that you can run with certain people and wear, you know, $5,000 suits with handcrafted shoes and you're successful, but your success will cost you everything. And what, what is success? What is it if a man gained the whole world and loses his own soul? Now, there are people still watching out there. Same number that joined us at the beginning. They're still there. Thank you. Don't let the world tell you what success. Let me tell you something. If you live your life in a moderate way and you never achieve financially the status of what people say is successful and you bring your children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord and you stay married to your spouse and your great children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren all come home to see you and you're in your 70s and 80s and even into your 90s as you have long life because you serve God and you never had a quarter of a million dollar sports car and you didn't have a house in such and such neighborhood I see well you're unbelief I'm gonna have all I'm, the, they that would be rich have pierced themselves through with many sorrows what do you mean if all you can think about is being rich and having success you will pierce yourself through many sorrows. Now, let me give you an example. We all know the Kennedys. It's even so bad they call it the Kennedy family curse. Death after death after death. But he was rich. Joe Kennedy was rich. I guess his name was Joe. Isn't that who it was? Joe Kennedy. Got his money bootlegging during Prohibition. Put it into a trust. The whole family's lived off that trust all these years. They got cousins that are rapists. They got kids that have been killed. I mean, they had one that went skiing and got killed. He ran into a tree and got killed, broke his neck, killed. John Jr. crashed his plane. The daughter had a, uh, had, had a mental disorder. They tried to give her a, a lobotomy and made her, she, put, she lived in an institution the rest of her life. John was assassinated. Robert was assassinated. Edward was a womanizing murderer okay but they had money they had success but what the good does it do you to gain the whole world and lose your soul and it has gone on and on and on and on and on and they all go into politics and they all are just you know it's it's it's, it's just sad it's sad and here you are and the world presents that as such a lovely lifestyle. I don't want my kids dead. I don't want to have everything in my life to end up in death every time you turn around. I know I don't have an estate, and I live off of the estate and the income it generates. I live in this house that's worth millions, but I don't have to pay any taxes because it's, it's in a tax-free estate or a, it's in a trust. And I just get, you know, we live off the interest from the trust. Hello? 
And I don't have what the world calls success. But I love my wife. I love God. I love God. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my church. And I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about, you know, uh, my, my church family, Rama. you know, Pastor Hagin's our pastor. And I love my job, preaching. Okay? If I live to the 90s, 100s, whatever, and I have all of that, when I leave and go to heaven, I will have been successful. They may not have to sell my quarter of a million dollar car when I pass. You know, the image of such great success to the world. But my legacy and what follows behind me will not be what car I drove. I look up Dad Hagen and I see, <laughs> I see uh, Craig, I mean, um, Pastor Hagen. Pastor H Kenneth E. Hagan, he's not, I mean, Kenneth W. Hagan, he's not Ken Jr. They called him that only to separate him from Dad Hagan because Brother Hagan was Kenneth E. Hagan. Pastor Hagan is Kenneth E. Hagan. But while he was alive, they called him Ken Jr. And that was only so that you wouldn't get him mixed up just saying the names. Okay? So he really technically wasn't a junior. But now, uh, Dad Hagan, Pastor Hagan, now um, Pastor Hagan's got Craig and, um, um, Denise, they're following him in the ministry. Their grandkids are preaching. What legacy has he left behind? Now, he had an element of prosperity as he lived, but he didn't live lasciviously. Okay? He didn't. He didn't drive quarter million dollar cars. Okay? But what legacy has he left behind? It's a spiritual legacy. And he's got his kids, his grandkids, his great grandkids following so who's what's more successful the guy who died and left nothing behind but, but, but ash and destruction and misery for their lives for their family's lives and for everything they touched their name is well known as the Kennedys or the Hagans who left this legacy behind who's more successful well this one had money yeah but that don't mean nothing because let me tell you something you can't take it with you. But you can take the history of your family and the, the um, things done by that family into eternity because there's treasure stored up in heaven. So let's, if we're going to make good decisions in life, we've got to have our priorities right in life. Amen. And they have, they have to come into play. And it will help keep you on track for making good decisions. Amen. Hope you all enjoyed that. Okay. Thank you all. I was trying to get 100%. Waiting for it all to kind of come in. All right. Hallelujah. Uh, amen. Hallelujah. All right. Let's receive tonight's offer. We're going to let you go. I know it's. My watch's not working right, is it? Yeah. Okay. Offering offerings, offer envelopes for seat backs. If you give electronically, go ahead and get that ready. Let's go get, get let's pray, let y'all get out of here. Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the people as they tithe and give. We thank you that the electronic offerings come in, those not the uh, the old offerings come in, old way of giving. Hallelujah. And people are blessed because they do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, Brother Joe, receive that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Online giving. We know this. It's uh give at expedition triad. I mean dollar sign. I mean PayPal is give at expeditiontriad.org. Uh, cash app is dollar sign expedition triad. Okay? Hallelujah. That's, that's the one that most people use is the um, expedition triad. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yep, got it on the forge somehow. Don't know how. I think I got it out on the regular one before that. Jesse's probably going... Why are you posting to Forge Youth? Because I liked it. You got that, Brother Joe? All right. Praise God. Love all y'all. Thank you for coming. Trust that, you know, you'll take these principles. God, spouse, children, church, job, 
Love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Have a great week. See you Sunday. Praise the Lord. Amen. We're